move on to our second speaker, Claire Bolton, who, is, who has been a letterpress printer for over 40 years and has transferred her experience of letterpress printing to the history of printing. And she will now talk about measuring skeletons, discovering the printer. Thank you very much. I'm going to talk today about printer's skeletons. Not those they keep in their closets, but the skeletons they kept on their presses. And I want to show how a close look at a printer's skeleton can offer further clues in understanding his printing practice. But first, what's a skeleton? This sketch shows two text blocks in the center with the supporting furniture and coins that lock up the chase. This is the form, ready for printing on the bed of a hand press. The positioning of the form and all the furniture surrounding the text blocks will not change throughout the printing of an edition. Excuse me. <coughs> the set lines of type will be changed for each pair of pages of the book, but the skeleton, the term used for all the support material, will stay the same until the printing is complete. The number of lines of text can, and often do, vary from page to page, often as a result of copy fitting vagaries. However, the skeleton shows the basic design thinking of the printing when planning his book, with the two most important measurements, the size of his text block and the width of the margin between them. This sketch shows the layout of two leaves of a, on a chancery folio sheet of paper being printed at the same time. For this paper, I've only dealt with chancery folios. They were generally printed two pages at a time, the maximum text area that could be printed in a single pull on a royal folio-sized press. If an edition was printed one page at a time, there could be discrepancies in the positioning of the sheet for each print run that would cause differences in the central margin between the text blocks. The two dotted areas here are the text blocks, each measuring 21 pica m's wide. Please note this is measured in m's, the printer's unit of measure. I'll say a bit more about print m's later. Although not shown in this sketch, the text blocks are here separated by two pieces of furniture, each four m's wide, the eight m's in the center, and then surrounded by other pieces of furniture, also measured in m's, to support the lines of type that make up the type block and fill out the form. This chart shows some of the measurements of Johann Zeiner's chancery folio editions printed in Ulm in the 1470s. His skeletons stayed the same for more than one edition. The first five editions at the top with a narrow 65 to 70 millimeter gutter or 12 M's of his type 116. And here I just remind you that 15th century type is described by the measurement in millimeters over 20 lines of text. Then he changed to a wider gutter measure of around 87 to 90 millimeters, or 15 M's of his type 116, and then nearer the bottom of the list, back to the narrow measure, now 14 M's of type 96. There could be a connection between the change in gutter measurement and a change of type size, but not necessarily. More important, though, is the chronological nature of the change in dimensions of his central margin. I suggest it could be used in helping to date one or two of his undated editions. For instance, his Decameron has to be printed after his Aesop, the one just above it on the in the list. And his Legend of Aurea, the one at the bottom, is most unlikely to have been printed by the ISTC suggested date of 1476. They were both printed with the later narrow margin, so had to be printed after 1476. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a chancery folio. Oh, sorry. I've been looking at a lot of these chancery folios. This is a brilliant example for accurate measuring, especially as it's been loose from its binding. This one was printed by Anton Sorg using his type 118. And we're going to come back to these conjugate leaves later. I want to briefly backtrack for a quick resume about typesetting and printing. Printers measure in M's. Today, they are pica M's, that is a 12-point M. 
a 12-point square. The rules here are printer's M rules, marked up in M's, as well as inches. In the 15th century, the printers also measured in M's, but there was no standardized point system then for describing type sizes, so each press had its own in-house measurement based on the square of the body of their own individual text type face. The bottom image shows a piece of type on the right with two different widths of spacing. The spacing is cast shorter than the type letter, so it doesn't print. Both spacing and type letters have the same body size from back to front, but differ in width. The left-hand space is an M, a square of the type body. Each line of type has to be exactly the same length as the others. To facilitate this type is set in a composing stick. Here, a stick with a fixed measure. And the measure would have been made especially to accommodate a certain number of full M's of their text face, perhaps 20 or 22 or as many as 36, depending on how long a line the printer wanted. And it's important to remember that the length of text line was fixed by the composing stick. A larger measure would need a longer stick to be made. Narrower measure would be compensated for by adding M spaces at the beginnings and ends of lines, thereby shortening the line of visible letters. Also, a change in measure meant that all the lengths of furniture would have to be changed to go along with the new text width. This is all financial practicalities for the printer as to why he might have kept to the same skeleton. The lines are assembled into the text block, hopefully all set to the same tension, so exactly the same length. Otherwise, there'd be problems with lockup. You can also see the M's used as spacing around the page number in the bottom line on the left of the image. This is a rare sighting of M spaces between two columns of text from a trial setting of the 36-line Bible around 1640. I love seeing inked rising spaces. They are a wonderful reminder of... The, oops, went on one. Sorry. Let's go back. Right. They are a wonderful reminder of parts of the page makeup that we don't usually see. Here, M's are being used to space out blocks of text rather than lengths of furniture. Let's now return to the form and skeletons. Apart from the text width, the space between the two text blocks in this folio form is the only measurement that the printer can control. The three outer margins at the head, foot, and foredge of the book will be trimmed by the binder, but this central margin is fixed. Printers measure. Without measurement, when working with all these little pieces of metal, it will be impossible to print pages of books. To understand printers, we also need to measure, and to measure their products, the books they printed. I record the measurements of every book I look at by measuring the leaf dimensions and all the margins and the text area, both in millimeters and M's, and sometimes at both head and foot and on more than one leaf, because printers do not always print straight, and binders do not always fold straight or trim straight. And I also notice the type size and the number of lines, as well as any information about provenance, when I can read it, and binding. Having noted the chronological changes in skeleton with Johann Zeiner, I began to measure editions by other printers to see if any similar patterns might arise. This is my set of M rules. Rulers marked up in M's rather than millimeters for almost every incunable type size. And here you can see the leaf we saw earlier with Sorg, which measures um, that his gutter is exactly 10 M's of his type 118 G. And his text width is 21 M's of type 118 G. As I measure and record the data, patterns start to emerge. After the first three editions, Sorg kept the same gutter, gutter size with both typefaces around 60 millimeters. If you can work your way along the top column. So he did change typeface, but basically kept to the same gutter size. The sa oh, sorry. The same with Johann Schusler. Um, Schusler only ever used one type size for the short life of his press between 1470 and 73. 
His text widths are the same in the whole seven editions looked at, and his gutter width remained the same with the same number of lines. When it comes to the St. Ulrich and Afra, I, interesting, I wasn't expecting the results I got. The text widths are consistent, but from my measurements taken of the copies looked at, there were enough variations in the gutter widths to suggest that five of the six editions at least had been printed one page at a time. I was not expecting this because St. Ulrich and Afra were well-known owners of the six royal presses that they purchased in 1472, <coughs> but they obviously weren't using it for the, these books. They were using a smaller press that could only do one chancery folio leaf at a time. And some other findings. You've got Martin Flach with 15 M's of his type 74, and Johann Gruninger with 13 M's of type 71, and Gunther Seiner with 12 M's of 108, type 118. I was finding consistent evidence that many other printers beyond Johann Seiner were using their in-house measurement, the M of their text type, as the basis for setting their text measure and the gutter between the text blocks. As I said before, measurements are vital to the printer, and they're equally vital, vital to anyone wanting to understand the printer and printing practice. Unfortunately, they're something that few of today's catalogues include. The BMC, the British Library's Catalogue of Incutables, recorded the text area of all the editions. It gives us a very good start in looking in more detail at printer's technical details. It gives format, quiring, the number of leaves, how many columns set, etc. Underneath are the dimensions of the leaf. I recommend the BMC as bedtime reading for anyone interested in incunabula. I mean, a bit awkward, but <laughs> yes, some of the information is out of date, but the compilers measured, and they thought chronologically, by country, then printing place within that country, and to printers in that place. Chronology is all important to printing history, especially when looking at this new emerging technology. However, what BMC did not measure were any of the margins. The leaf dimensions are given, which gives an indication of how much trim has been made by later binders, but the gutter, the margin between two columns of type, was not recorded, nor the central gutter between two pages, as of the chancery folios. Paul Needham's been pleading for many years for more measurements particularly of leaf sizes, to be included in catalogues and has done so in a, again in a recent paper presented to Wolfenbüttel Arbeitskreis of 2015. In that publication, he lists all the catalogues that have included measurements, which is nice. So I measure, as described above. It's not always easy to get an accurate measurement. Pages can sometimes be set to different widths in the same edition. Here, you've got the text measure of 21 m's on the inner form and 22 m's on the outer form. You can just see the show through there. Older bindings are often better, but not always, for measuring the rebound copies. Here, a row of incunables in pretty good condition. Personally, I prefer copies that are a conservator's challenge and give me a broken spine every time to measure. Otherwise, it's probably best to measure the leaf width when the book is closed. Where do you measure? This book had a flat foredge and a rounded back, so there's quite a few millimeters difference in leaf width. And then there's problems with the center gutter. I've come to dread the description, 19th century bound for Bodley. <laughs> it almost always means a very tight binding where getting into the center of a signature for accurate measurement is almost impossible. And be, that's all right, don't twitch too much. I have done this very <laughs> gently. Um, <laughs> My mylar scale can sometimes help me get into the center fold or my cardboard M rule. Um, but sometimes copies have been too tightly bound for me to take this measurement at all. But another problem is if the book has been rebound, if there have been worn spine folds and they've been repaired and the original dimensions of the central gutter have been lost. <coughs> and then, yeah, rounding and backing. I mean, there's five to six millimeters extra on the leaf widths tucked in here. So apart from problems with tight bindings and rounding and backing, uh, you've got sewing thread that can get in the way and you can't always get round it or under it. And there's vellum strips and, yeah. I mean, wonderful, beautiful bindings. That's bits of Caxton down that one. That was taken in Dunedin. <laughs> what use are all these measurements? 
I suggest that recording the measurements of skeletons can provide a further layer of evidence that can help in identification of a printer for some of the additions that still do not have a certain home or can help clarify a date of printing when not given. I've got a couple of examples. Um, this Friedrich Kreusner in Nuremberg was a fairly consistent printing, printer, used the same type for all his chancery folio editions. The skeletons of his earlier editions up to 1476 have a text width of 22 m's and a gutter of 14 m's of his text type 110. Not all of them have printed dates in the colophon. By early 1477, his text is set 1 m wider and the gutters measure 3 m's narrower. Perhaps he was saving paper by putting more text on the page. So during the changeover period, and the two copies, um, editions I was talking about are high lit on this table, um, he printed the two different undated editions of the same text written by Johannes Gerson. Both have the same number of lines to the page. However, their text widths and gutter are different, indicating that the first edition was printed around 1475 and the other definitely after 1476. Happily, the dates of printing were originally discussed by Alfred Pollard in BMC uh, from evidence of watermarks, good things, in two different papers used in the two editions. But my skeleton information discovered agreed with Pollard's findings. And another example. There have been a number of unidentified printers of incunable editions, one of them known as the printer of the 1475 Aquinas Summa. His editions have been attributed to both Konrad Feiner and Heinrich Eggestein, both printers working in Strasbourg with a very similar typeface. From looking at the skeletons on all three sources, although the differences are slight, I'm convinced that the printer of the 1472 Aquinas is neither Feiner nor Eggestein. Eggestein had a consistent number of lines for his chancery folios and a narrow gutter. Feiner was quite inconsistent in the number of lines and text widths and had a wider gutter. And the printer of the Aquinas had a consistent number of lines, but it was very difficult to be sure about his gutter because two of the four editions had been printed one page at a time and the other copy looked at it had its spine repaired. However, I suggest that it's incorrect, at least until any more evidence comes up, to assign any of the Aquinas printer's editions to either Feiner or Eggestein. Now, you have, oh, it's not too bad. I thought it might be ter terribly small. You have this as a handouts. Um, this is a summary of what I've done to date. So the one with the yellow um, takes you through, it's, I'm afraid, alphabetical by place, printer by chronology. And if we just look at Gunther Seiner, I can go through the first one as an example. So using his type 117G, his text width was 124, and this is for three copies, if you see the column number of editions. So three copies were fixed to this. Text width of 22 M's, the gutter is 12 M's, and then the final column I've put together uh, a sort of formula. So you've got the type size 117, and then you've got the text width and the, text and the gutter and the text width in M's and the number of editions that have come like that. And the second, oh, the second one is just that formula, but listed by type size area. Um, I don't know. This needs to be taken further. I've got a few hundred more books to look at and measure um, <laughs> to see if I can extend it. But it should be possible to look up a type size and see who used that type size and what their text, gutter text formula is. They may all be the same, but they haven't been, despite the fact that they're all working to a very similar um, type, um, sorry, uh, page size. So, suggestions, Te measurements I would like. I would, yes, the area of the text block if it's not in BMC. Leaf dimensions if the book you're describing is not in B BMC. The four edge margin would be wonderful. Space between two columns of text on a page and the central gutter. <laughs> um, between the two chancery folio pages, if you can get in there. Thank you. Oh, 
Oh, right. Sorry. Yes. <laughs> right, good. Someone's Thank taking it much. seriously. Thank you very much, Claire. Yes, I just took a photo of the list, so <laughs> I can bear that in mind um, here at the library. Yeah. Yes. We've got a roaming mic now. I bet. I bet. Mm, there's lots of them, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yes. 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 Yes, oh yes. Yep. And um and there that's one aspect of the environment your system doesn't deal with it, and that seems to me more apparent. Oh yes, yes. Now it's initiated by Turkey, I know that, but I think it's too easy a way out that they involve the Well I think that's quite important when you Yeah. Mm. Yes. No. Yeah. Uh. No. No. They would be wonderful. No. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh well. Should we ask for all three margins as well? <laughs> Not just the four edge. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh yes. Yes. No. It's very uncommon. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. But I think my key point was actually measure. Please yeah. measure. Yeah, Keep as measuring as, as much as you can. can. Yeah. 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 Uh, we have probably time for one more question. There is another one. Oh, that's no? Fine. Okay, okay. then. Thank, Thank you. you very much again, Thank Claire. You. And I'm now going to introduce our third speaker.